Our scripture this morning is found in Hosea. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through 15. Hosea 5, verses 5 through 15. Have you ever gone looking for something that wasn't really important to you? If you had come into this room and lost a penny, how hard would you look for it? If you'd come into this room and lost a $100 bill, how hard would you look for it? See, beloved, what Brother Corey just sang about in that song that we just sang is what we're talking about this morning. And that is that God calls us to seek Him with all of our heart because after all, that's what He did for us. God could have sent a prophet to say, Y'all know where I am. I ain't never moved. I gave you the law. Told you how to go about this. You figure it out. But God loved us so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him would never perish but have everlasting life. God calls us to seek Him with all of our heart. Hosea chapter 5, verses 5 through 15, in the honor of the reading of God's Word. Let's stand, please. (coughs) Moreover, the pride of Israel testifies against Him. And Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. Judah also has stumbled with them. They will go with their flocks and herds to seek the Lord, but they will not find Him. He has withdrawn from them. They have dealt treacherously against the Lord, for they have borne illegitimate children. Now the new moon will devour them with their land. Blow the horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah. Sound an alarm at beth Avon. Behind you, Benjamin, Ephraim will become a desolation in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel, I declare what is sure. The princes of Judah have become like those who move a boundary. On them I will pour out my wrath like water. Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment, because he was determined to follow man's command. Therefore, I am like a moth to Ephraim, and and like rottenness to the house of Judah. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent the king Jerob. But he is unable to heal you or to cure you of your wound. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear to pieces and go away. I will carry away and there will be none to deliver. I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the reading of your perfect and infallible word in our midst this morning. And God, we thank you uh, that you illumined the heart and mind of Hosea when you gave to him this perfect and infallible word. And God, we pray that you would illumine our hearts and minds this morning as well, that you would cause us to seek you with all of our hearts. Father God, we love you with all of our soul. We trust you with all of our heart. We offer to you our love, our lives, and this prayer in and through the name of our risen Lord and Master, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. As we began our examination of this chapter last time, What we saw is that there were a lot of people that that most of the people that, that Hosea is addressing knew a lot about God, okay? They knew a lot about God. They knew the law. 
and they knew, they thought they knew where all of the loopholes in the law were. They, they, they thought they knew that, 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 you know, that, that they could go exactly this far and no further. And if there was something that they really, really wanted to do, that there was always a way around that. They knew a lot about God, but they didn't know Him. They didn't know Him. You know, I, I love to study history. And, and I've read about a lot of historical figures. I know a lot about Muhammad. But I don't know him. I will never be able to know him. That's a whole other sermon. They knew a lot about God. But their heart wasn't in it. They were hedging their bets. I, the applications here are just so far reaching. The, the main reason, the main reason that they didn't want to know God was because they knew at some level that you cannot come to know this God and remain the same. Listen, why do a lot of people get into what we have called stolen valor? You know what stolen valor is? It's where someone who never served goes out and buys a military uniform. Or even someone like me, okay, going out and buying a Purple Heart. Now, I got hurt when I was in the Marine Corps, okay. I mean, I got a messed up knee from being in the Marine Corps. But nobody was shooting at me when that happened, okay. I didn't get injured in combat. Therefore, I don't rate a Purple Heart. A lot of people go into stolen valor because they want the benefits without ever having gone through the transformation. A lot of people want to, to they want to, to sign that little card that says, I've been born again. They want the preacher to, to give them a quick little bath, but they're not really interested in being transformed. They don't want their life to change. What? Listen to me. What they want is for their eternity to change, but they don't want their life to change. That's exactly the situation that Hosea is ministering into. These people, listen, they didn't believe that, that God might be the only God. Listen, we're the only nation around that worships this God. Since when does might make right? How many of y'all, like when you came home and, and you wanted to go out to a, a movie picture and and it was rated R. And your mama said, no, you aren't going to an R-rated movie. And you said, but mama, all my friends' mamas are letting them go. And your mama went, oh, well, then that settles it. You can go. Did that work for anybody in here? Okay. See, they were looking at all of the people around them. Remember where all this started? Remember where it started? What was God's instruction when they came into the land of promise? Take them all out. Now, that sounds mean. That sounds vindictive. It sounds like God is a God of judgment. And He is. He's not mean. He's not vindictive. But God is a God of judgment, 
He judges sin. But you remember the warning that God gave to them? He said, listen, if you don't do this, then you're going to be corrupted by the gods that they worship. And, and what was their attitude? What do you think we're a bunch of idiots? That ain't going to happen to us, God. That's not going to happen to us. We're not going to get corrupted. We're not going to start worshiping these other gods. What happened? Within one generation, what happened? They did start doing exactly what God said would happen if they didn't follow His instructions. To truly know God is to be transformed by Him. You know, here's the deal. A lot of churches will talk about, you know, come as you are. And you know what they mean by that. You know what most of them mean by that? We don't care what you're wearing. Okay? We don't care about your clothes. Okay? We mean it on a much deeper level. But we love you too much to leave you the way that we found you. Okay? We love you too much to leave you the way that you are. And we're not going to be able to change you. But we're going to put you in touch with the one who can. Because, listen to me, to know Him is to be transformed by Him. You know, I never will forget, not too long after... I'd surrendered to, to preach the gospel. I was doing supply preaching over in Cock County. And I got a call to go out to this little church in the country, Manish Chapel Baptist Church, out in the country. Little did I know that one of my former high school teachers was a member of that church. And, and she met my mom somewhere before, you know, before Angie and I went out there to preach and and she said something, we've got a Larry Jones coming out to preach here. And Mom said, yeah, that's my Larry. And Miss Miller said, your Larry is coming out to preach? <laughs> to know him is to be transformed by him. Okay? To know him is to be transformed by him. Let me ask you a question. Do we take seriously? And I'll tell you all the same thing. No, I don't have, you know, this pressing thing. I, the reason I keep looking at my watch, I'll stop if you want me to. But that clock ain't working, okay? And so I, I've got to keep myself on pace to, to be done by 1.30. Anyway. When people look at us, let me ask you this question. If a non-Christian watching how you move through your last problem was watching you closely, how would they feel about Jesus? If a non-Christian were watching how you move through your last financial shortfall, saw how you dealt with that, would they be more inclined toward Jesus or would they be more inclined toward whoever issued that credit card? When people... Boy, I didn't get an amen. It's gotten awful quiet in here. See, beloved, when people understand that we are Christians, when when when... We, they understand that we're Christians. When you get you one of them in God we trust license plates, I'll leave that alone. They're watching us. Would they embrace the Christ that we proclaim? And here's the other question. Is the Christ we proclaim the Christ revealed in the Bible? There is a difference, or there can be. 
There can be. Because that's what's going on here. The God that they proclaimed is not the God of the Bible. And that's the whole point that God is coming to them about. He's saying, listen, you're not being faithful to my words. You're not being faithful to anything that I have said. I mean, verse 5, the pride of Israel testifies against him, and Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. The problem that we see in Hosea is that sin can very quickly become an obsession with us. You know, Brother Richie, in talking about lying this morning, how many of y'all have ever been able to get out of a situation by telling just one lie? You can't. You got to keep going. You got to keep telling more and more lies. You got to start bolstering that lie up with other lies. These people were trying to hedge their bets. <laughs> Aren't you glad we don't do that? They wanted the blessings that God had promised to them. Remember what God said? A land flowing with milk and honey. And you know what the symbol of the Israeli tourist board or bureau is? It's two guys carrying a stick with a large cluster of grapes on it. And that goes all the way back to where they said it was going to be. Let's go. And ten of them said, there be giants in the land. There be giants in the land. And Caleb said, but, 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 and they said, no, they be giants in the land. We'd rather wander around for another 40 years here in the desert than trust God for His promise. And so they wandered around for 40 years in the desert until that generation died. And they came in. Because, listen to me. They wanted it both ways. They wanted it both ways. Do you all understand that in life that, that an awful lot of life is binary? Okay, when I asked Angie to marry me, by definition, what was I doing? Choosing her over every other woman in the world. Does that make sense? That was a very binary decision. You choose one and that's it. Okay, you can't choose one and keep a bunch of others. What do we say in... And our wedding vows forsaking most others? I don't think any of the women would be on board with that. Forsaking all others. Forsaking all others. But these people don't want to forsake all others. They look right over across the land. And they see that these people that worship Baal, or Baal, their crops growing just as good Maybe even better than, than the Israelis' crops. And when they go to church, mm, they do things a whole lot different at that church. And so these people said, well, you know, maybe there's something to this all after all. Tell you what, we're not going to turn our back completely on God, but we're going to whore ourselves off to all. And we're going to try to keep God from finding out that we did it. They got to the point that they were proud of being proud. You ever met somebody that was proud in their sin? I mean proud in their sin. That's where these people are. They are so proud of themselves. See, God calls us to live a life of self-examination. You know, 
We like to pretend that we don't really have a good measuring rod. We do. It's called the Bible. Now, I'm not up here preaching a bunch of legalism. But what I am saying is that if I want to know how my walk with Jesus is going today, then all I have to do is ask myself, do I love others and love Him more today than I did yesterday? Am I spreading His love and His Word more now (coughs) than I have in the past? You know one of the questions that I'll generally go and ask somebody where I'm not sure of their spiritual condition? Has there ever been a time in your life where you loved Jesus more then than you love Him now? See, that's a nice way of asking, are you backslidden? Okay? Do we need to renew that relationship with Jesus in your life? See... When the Lord identifies sin in our life, we have two choices. We either deal with it or allow Him to deal with it and we're blessed, or we don't deal with it and it gets worse and we're miserable. Verses 5 through 7. Hosea is showing us a cause and effect relationship. The cause, the pride of Israel testifies against him. The effect, Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. And Judah has stumbled with them. In verse 6, there's a, a glimmer of the effectiveness of Hosea's warning. Momentarily. Momentarily, they turn away. They will go with their flocks and herds to seek the Lord. But they will not find Him. You know what happens in our life sometimes? We drift so far away from where we started that we don't even remember where we started. And if we don't remember where we started, it's really hard to get a bearing and get somewhere that we know where we are. These people had so thoroughly turned their back on God that they forgot where to start. All they knew is, you know, this God won't let us worship Him with sex. He wants lambs and goats. and So let's round up some livestock and go somewhere and do something. Do you understand that that's what happens when you begin taking the Bible completely out of context? When you find yourself in a mess and you begin kind of swooping into various places in the Bible looking for something to salve your soul but not really deal with the problem, and that's what they're doing. And God tells us they're not going to find them, verse 6, because... He has withdrawn from them. Here's the deal. Baal could never withdraw. Why? Because he's an idol. He can't move. All you can do is, you know, go pick up the statue and move it somewhere else. But God is the living God. And they're not going to find him because he has withdrawn from them. Because they have dealt treacherously against the Lord. They have borne illegitimate children. Now, listen. This isn't just talking about sexual licentiousness. Okay? Do you understand that pride is an illegitimate child of our spirituality? Do you understand that covetousness is an illegitimate child in our relationships. So see, so many times we just read these verses and we go, you know, this doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. It does apply to us. 
They've dealt treacherously against the Lord because their pride has led them to places that God is never going to inhabit. See, here's the deal. How many of y'all, if you're in the grocery store and you see a man buying flowers, do you wonder, is it birthday or anniversary or is he in trouble? Okay. All right. Is he in trouble and he's hoping this will fix the problem? Okay. Ladies, I guarantee you there's some problems that your husband could create that every flower in the world ain't going to fix. Okay, all right. And these people thought that if we just go and mumble a few religious words, rub the blood the way that God said to, and we just offer this lamb, we offer this goat, we offer this dove, we offer this drink offering, God is going to be placated and we'll be able to get back to our lives without any interference or any more interference from Him. God is not going to be found when our allegiance is to anyone or anything but Him. God marked that the way back in Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Let me ask you a question. You saw in the middle of that song we sang the, the parable that Jesus told from, from Luke 15 that, that it's based upon. How many of y'all think the shepherd just kind of went out that day and went, Here, let me, let me. Let me, let me. Not here. Oh, well, let's go. Do you understand what Jesus is building in this parable? Because we begin with a lost coin, and then a lost sheep, and then a lost son. Jesus is talking about the fervency of the Father. And he says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. God says, I'm willing to go all in with you. Are you willing to go all in with me? That's what he's saying. Because if you're willing to go all in with me, God says, then I will bless you. All right. I know it's 25 to 6. what time it is back there. So, Paul is talking about these various, or I'm sorry, Hosea is talking about these various offerings. He talks about, uh, you know, how they're going to come and and, and do their thing, and they're going to hope that God is is just kind of okay with that. Paul draws on the imagery of these same offerings in Philippians 2, 12 through 18. He says, so then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Listen, beloved, who are they obeying? Are they obeying Paul? No, they're obeying God. They're obeying God. Because God had spoken through Paul and they recognized that. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul is not preaching a works-based system of salvation. What he's saying is the same thing that James said. What he's saying is that if you are saved, if you are genuinely saved, it's going to show. When you come into the life of another person and you think for a moment that the king of the universe has made you an ambassador for Christ, that ought to cause you fear and trembling. That the God of the universe is going to allow you to say to someone else, Thus saith the Lord. For it is God who is at work in you. Doesn't that scare you, beloved? I mean, you know, I kind of understand that that God knows everything about me. But, you know, Lou can testify one of the most stressful days in the barracks. 
is when you have what's called an IG, an inspector general. And general does not mean a general inspection. It means a general is in the house. And he's looking at everything. Everything. And if he doesn't see it, his colonels will see it. And you're kind of nervous no matter how much you scrub, how much you polish that the general is in the house. And doesn't it, shouldn't it cause us fear and trembling to know that God is at work in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure? In other words, get yourself out the way and let God do the work that he wants to do. Do all things, oh, let's skip that verse. I mean, come on. We're Baptists. We love to complain. Do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Don't you love how the Bible doesn't just say don't do this, but it explains why? Doesn't that make more sense to you? How many of y'all ever played why with mama and daddy? You know what I mean. You can't go there. Why? Because I said so. Why? And you just keep playing why until they've had enough. But anyway, the Bible tells you why. Children of God above reproach. Children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. I don't know about you, but that sounds like be ye in the world but not of the world. Holding fast the word of life. Holding fast the word of life. So that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and I share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. See, Paul understood that there were there was only one place to get help from. Really quickly, verses 8 through 14. Yeah. Israel is in dire straits because Assyria is jonesing for them. And so they were living in, in this world of religious plurality. And they're in a mess because of it. And so where do they choose to go for help? How many of y'all would go and ask a Buddhist monk how to find a satisfying life with Jesus? How many of y'all would go and ask an imam how to live the victorious Christian life? But that's exactly what they're doing. They're going and asking the enemy how they live a better life with God. And you see, beloved, we can't walk by human precepts until we first reject God's precepts. That's what happens when we look at the Word and say, oh, that'll never work. That'll never work. Verse 15. The pronouncement of judgment was not God's last word to His people. He gave them a wonderful promise and hope for the future. He declared that His presence was withdrawn from them, but that it would be back. The goal of God's judgment was to cause them to seek Him. It was not destructive, but restoration. Two concluding thoughts. Number one, a day of judgment is coming. A day of judgment is coming. Every one of us will give an account for what we have done on earth just as the Israelites were called upon to give an account. Matthew 16, 27, Jesus said, For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of His Father with His angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. And number two, a day of salvation is at hand for any who repent. And turn to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. Working together with Him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For He says, at the acceptable time, I listened to you. And on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now 
is the day of salvation. Oh, beloved, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Will we seek God with all of our heart and with all of our strength?